SCP-106 is one of the most iconic figures within the SCP universe, known for its terrifying presence and lasting impact on the lore. Similar to other notorious entities like SCP-96, SCP-173, and SCP-076, SCP-106 is an inhuman creature with a total disregard for human life and a seemingly unkillable nature. What sets SCP-106 apart from others is its apparent enjoyment in inflicting pain and suffering on its victims. SCP-106 takes the form of an elderly male who appears to be in an advanced state of decomposition. It has the ability to scale any vertical surface and can remain stationary for extended periods while waiting for its prey. Although not particularly fast, SCP-106 relies on ambush tactics patiently lying in wait for days if needed. One of its most unsettling traits is its ability to corrode any solid material it touches, whether it's plant matter, metal, or living tissue. This corrosive effect lingers for up to six hours after contact, manifesting as rust, decay, and cracks, along with a black, mucus-like substance that is similar to what covers SCP-106 itself. Additionally, SCP-106 can move through solid matter, leaving behind corrosive patches of mucus in its wake. This ability to phase through solid objects appears to be linked to SCP-106's access to a pocket dimension, an alternate self-contained reality that it controls. This dimension is primarily made up of corridors and rooms and serves as SCP-106's personal hunting ground. The creature can enter this dimension through any surface and can re-emerge from any connected surface, such as moving through a wall and then appearing through the ceiling. Using these abilities, SCP-106 hunts its prey, typically targeting humans between the ages of 10 and 25. It incapacitates its victims with a single touch, often causing severe damage to vital organs, muscles, tendons or bones, leaving them alive but helpless. Afterward, SCP-106 drags its victims into the pocket dimension, where it likely continues to torment them. Containing SCP-106 presents a significant challenge due to its ability to corrode any material it touches and pass through solid objects. Researchers have discovered that SCP-106 exhibits a strong dislike for lead, which has led to the construction of its containment unit using lead-lined steel. This primary containment is reinforced with 40 additional layers of lead-lined steel, each separated by a gap, and the entire structure is suspended above the ground. The secondary containment area is even more intricate, consisting of 16 spherical cells filled with various liquids and a randomized arrangement of surfaces and supports. This complex configuration appears to disorient SCP-106, which struggles to navigate through unpredictable environments. Additionally, the secondary containment is equipped with high-intensity light systems, as SCP-106 is also averse to extreme brightness. Although these containment strategies do not entirely prevent breaches, they have significantly reduced their frequency. The containment area is under continuous 24-hour human surveillance, and any signs of corrosion within 200 meters of SCP-106's cell are treated with immediate concern. Despite these precautions, SCP-106 frequently breaches containment, sometimes remaining dormant for extended periods to create a false sense of security among staff. During a breach, SCP-106 causes extensive corrosive damage and abducts individuals to its pocket dimension. When containment is compromised, Foundation personnel promptly repair the damaged areas and prepare a human subject, usually a D-class between the ages of 10 and 25. The subject is then injured, typically by severing the Achilles tendon or fracturing the thigh bone, rendering them immobile. Placed within the containment cell, the subject's cries of pain eventually lure SCP-106 back. If this fails, additional trauma may be inflicted, or more subjects may be introduced. Given SCP-106's immunity to physical harm, Containment remains the Foundation's primary method of managing the entity. SCP-106, as detailed in its primary documentation, has become a well-known entity within the SCP Foundation, inspiring numerous related stories and tales. 
One of the most notable of these is a tale called The Young Man, which explores a possible origin story for SCP-106. This narrative is set during World War I and revolves around a corporal named Lawrence. Lawrence was a dutiful soldier who followed orders and performed his duties as expected, but he struggled to connect with others. Despite his efforts, Lawrence remained an outsider, not because he didn't try, but because there was something inherently different about him. He was a quiet, withdrawn figure who kept to himself in the trenches, yet his presence seemed to evoke a sense of unease among his comrades. Physically, Lawrence was unremarkable, average in height, weight, and appearance. However, he exhibited a few peculiar behaviors. He had a habit of staring at people slightly longer than was comfortable, and at night, he would mumble in his sleep, often speaking of strange and unsettling things. On one occasion, another soldier overheard him muttering the name of his daughter, followed by a soft, eerie giggle, which prompted the soldier to relocate to a different barracks. Lawrence, along with 14 other soldiers, was sent across no man's land to investigate an enemy trench that had gone silent for several days. Some speculated that the decision to send Lawrence was less about his combat abilities and more about removing him from the rest of the troops. In fact, it seemed that many hoped he wouldn't return. During the three days that Lawrence and the others were on this mission, the soldiers left behind in the trench began to talk about him. They realized that no one had ever heard him speak of home, and he never wrote or received letters. He often spoke about his dreams, but otherwise, he seemed devoid of passion or personal connection. As the soldiers discussed Lawrence, questions arose within the higher ranks as well. No one could locate his station orders or any documentation concerning his presence. Although he had arrived with a reinforcement squad from France, none of the other reinforcements remembered seeing him before, as they were part of a mixed group from various squads. Adding to the mystery, Nearly every man who had shared quarters with Lawrence ended up with trench foot, and he left behind a musty, sickly sweet odor wherever he went. These oddities led to whispers among the soldiers, who began to believe that Corporal Lawrence might be a curse. Despite everything, Lawrence and the other soldiers made their way across no man's land and reached the German trench, only to find it eerily empty and silent. The trench was devoid of any signs of life. There were no insects, no rodents, nothing. However, they did find a sticky, slime-like substance that had seeped into every crevice and crack. The trench was in complete disrepair, with no trace of any living or dead beings, until one soldier stumbled upon what was left of a human body. The remains were gruesome. The flesh had somehow been smeared across the entire floor of a barracks, with rotting bones jutting out at odd angles. The skull had been placed on a bunk bed, with ten fingertip bones jammed into the eye sockets. More remains were soon discovered. A circle of hands with the fingers interlocked. Two figures in a tunnel with leathery, mummy-like skin covered in a black, oily substance. The latrines were overflowing with a horrifying mix of excrement and organs. And the surface was dotted with thousands of disembodied eyeballs. By this point, Many of the soldiers were openly discussing retreating from the horrific scene, but Corporal Lawrence continued to search the area. Eventually, he came across a hole that appeared to be the entrance to a natural cavern. A nearby private watched as Lawrence peered into the darkness before sliding in headfirst. The private rushed over to help, but the inky blackness of the hole revealed nothing. He could hear faint sounds, rustling, liquid shifting, followed by a nauseating stench that made the private gag. The rest of the soldiers gathered around, and soon Lawrence emerged from the hole, pale, trembling, and covered in a thick, black, tar-like substance. He began to vomit more of the same black slime, his body racked with shudders. After he finally stopped, the soldiers grabbed him and hastily retreated from the trench, half carrying him back to safety. When they reached their own trench, they collapsed in exhaustion, some gasping for breath, others sobbing uncontrollably. The soldiers who were still coherent were debriefed, but their accounts of the strange events were dismissed as hallucinations caused by battle fatigue or the effects of experimental gas weapons. Lawrence spoke little about his experience in the hole, merely claiming that he had fallen into an underground pool or a buried latrine, struggled for a while, 
and eventually climbed out. He was instructed not to discuss the incident further, but oddly enough, he seemed to be in better spirits afterward. Lawrence became more talkative, often rambling about his newfound appreciation for confined spaces and the concepts of creation and destruction. A constant, unsettling smile appeared on his face, leaving his comrades longing for the return of the old, withdrawn Corporal Lawrence. One night, a private confided in a friend that he had woken up to find Lawrence standing over him, his eyes gleaming with an eerie light. The following day, that same private was found tangled in barbed wire, his intestines gruesomely spread out in all directions. A few days later, a debilitating sickness spread through the soldiers in the trench, rapidly deteriorating their flesh as if it were being eaten away by acid, turning it into a black, oozing mass. The illness claimed many lives, and Lawrence was eventually sent to a hospital. However, after he attacked a nurse, an assault that left her with three missing fingers and blindness in her right eye, he was transferred to a mental institution. In the ward, Lawrence would quietly rant to other patients, speaking of endless corridors, relentless chases in the dark, and flesh laid out like the pages of a book. His behavior grew increasingly erratic and disturbing, and he would occasionally vanish from the ward entirely, reappearing hours later without any explanation. The mysterious wasting sickness that had plagued his trench seemed to follow him wherever he went. Despite numerous attempts to transfer Lawrence to other facilities, no official records could ever be found about him. Reappearing hours later without any explanation, the mysterious wasting sickness that had plagued his trench seemed to follow him wherever he went. Despite numerous attempts to transfer Lawrence to other facilities, no official records could ever be found about him. Then, on a night in November, Lawrence and 18 other patients disappeared during a brief five-minute nurse rotation. The room they had occupied was left in a horrific state, reeking of rust, oil, mold, and decay, with thick, black ooze coating the floor, beds, and walls. Under one of the beds, a spiral made of human teeth was discovered, the number of teeth matching exactly the number of missing individuals, save for one. After that night, neither Lawrence nor the other patients were ever seen again, and the incident was lost among the many horrors of the war. However, rumors began to circulate of bizarre deaths, men disappearing only to be found later, broken and twisted, and of a shadowy figure stalking the towns of Europe. So. That's one possible origin story for SCP-106. While the allure of the SCP universe often lies in the mysteries surrounding these anomalies, some might enjoy the idea of a backstory. Even with this narrative, however, there are still questions left unanswered. What truly became of Corporal Lawrence? Did some alien entity take over his body? component placement transforming him into SCP-106? Or was he altered by exposure to an unknown substance, suggesting the possibility of multiple SCP-106 entities existing? As with many other tales, you're free to embrace or disregard this one, depending on your preferences. Another theory about SCP-106's origins comes from the story Until Death. I won't dive into as much detail on this one, but it's worth noting that this tale is more impactful if you're already familiar with SCP-3001, Red Reality. This tale centers around an older female researcher working late at night, alone in a Foundation facility. She hears a noise in the corner of her lab and goes to investigate when suddenly the lights go out, plunging her into darkness. She quickly turns on her phone's flashlight and looks back at her desk, only to find a bloody human kidney lying on her papers. The noise she heard grows more intense, and she notices a black smear spreading across the wall, with the paint and plaster corroding away. As she approaches, a hand shoots out from the wall and grabs her arm, the black slime eating through her lab coat. SCP-106 emerges from the wall, decrepit and decayed, grinning as it advances toward her. Black, foul-smelling sludge drips from its form as the researcher runs out of the lab, heading for the night guard. When she reaches the guard, SCP-106 appears, still in pursuit. The guard fires three shots at SCP-106, causing it to fall to the ground and sink through the floor. This marks the first recorded sighting of SCP-106, 
and the staff have no idea what they're dealing with. Suddenly SCP-106 reappears, descending from the ceiling above the guard, dripping acid onto his face before brutally killing him. The researcher, having twisted her ankle, limps away toward the guard station. As she enters, however, the floor begins to melt beneath her, and the black ooze starts burning her skin. She sinks into the blackness, but the pain fades as she finds herself in an unfamiliar room. Looking around, she realizes she's in a dilapidated hallway within some sort of alternate dimension. Still hopeful, she limps forward, eventually opening a door and stepping into what appears to be her old apartment. Given that the building had been demolished 20 years ago, she was understandably bewildered. Everything appeared just as it had been, but when she opened a closet, a heap of dismembered corpses tumbled out onto her. After struggling to free herself from the horrific scene, she recognized one of the faces. It was the night guard. Suddenly, SCP-106 emerged from the back of the closet, and she took off running again, realizing that she was in a twisted version of the facility she worked in. Desperate, she made her way back to the guard room where she had first entered this dimension, hoping she could find a similar way out, all while SCP-106 pursued her relentlessly. Just as SCP-106 closed in, she managed to reach the guard room and sink through the same floor, re-emerging in the real facility. She hit the alarm button, but SCP-106 was right behind her. To her horror, she realized that the entity had taken the night guard's throat and placed it in its own, producing a growling sound. The growl intensified, eventually forming a word, red. Then two more words followed, both of which were Anna. The realization struck her with terrifying clarity, and SCP-106 stepped closer, raising its hand to reveal a ring where the night guards had been. Paralyzed with fear, she couldn't move or think as SCP-106 reached out and touched her cheek. Her flesh began to melt away, and SCP-106 leaned in to kiss her, fusing their faces together in a grotesque embrace. She tried to scream, but her tongue had already melted and her throat was filled with liquefied tissue. The two of them sank through the floor together, locked in a final, horrifying union. This story serves as both a potential backstory for SCP-106 and an epilogue to SCP-3001, suggesting that Robert Scranton did manage to escape the Red Reality, but he was no longer the man he once was.